I'm Jim Estep, Fire Chief of Prince George's County, Maryland. On September 28, 1982, a tragedy occurred. It's the nightmare that every fire chief fears, and it actually happened here in our county. The nightmare is a phone call informing the chief that a firefighter has been injured in the line of duty. This time, it was firefighter Sandy Lee. Sandy was the first female eligible in our department to attend officer candidate school. She had actually cleared all the hurdles, and she was soon to be Sergeant Lee. Now she lay gravely injured near death. I was told that Sandy had fallen from the side bucket of a ladder truck, and she was dragged under the wheels. Sandy's going to tell her own personal experience later, but one year after her accident, another firefighter was killed in our county. He had prematurely stepped from the rear of a responding engine and was backed over and also crushed under the wheels. Although we had vigorously uh, pursued the retrofit of safety features on all of our equipment and our driving and safety regulations were very stringent, apparently this had not been enough. We revised our response regulations, making it mandatory to be fully suited with gear on, with belts fastened, and bars in place. In addition, firefighters have to be seated before the driver can actually move the equipment. The driver himself has got to physically check around the unit, and finally, the officer must dismount and check the rear, guiding the unit as it backs. And this is paramount if someone is on the rear step. I can't personally take that nightmare any longer, and neither can Sandy Lee. I'll never forget my thoughts the evening of her accident. I had been briefed by our duty officer that Sandy probably wouldn't live to reach the hospital. The ride to the Prince George's County General Hospital Trauma Center seemed like an eternity for me. Racing through my mind was how would I face her family and how would I face her situation? Not only was Sandy a firefighter with our department, but she was a family friend. Eventually, her parents did arrive at the hospital and they were ever so gracious, and they did more to comfort us than we probably did to help them. They never placed blame. They were more worried about the driver and the crew than themselves. But that didn't relieve the agony that I personally felt about that situation. Uh, I have not been able to answer the question to this day about whether or not uh, I had done enough to have prevented that accident. You know, everyone in the fire service has the basic responsibility to protect and preserve life and property. But we also have a sacred responsibility to protect the lives of those that serve. They are dependent on their officers and leaders to do everything possible to make the job of firefighting safe. Even when we have to implement regulations that firefighters themselves find annoying, we must do it. Mark Twain once said that courage is not the absence of fear, it's the conquering of fear. Sandy Lee and those firefighters who've endured similar experiences are the true heroes of our system. Their courage is undaunted. We owe them everything, and each of us must help. Uh, we as firefighters can overcome the fear of change, and we can find the courage to free us from the shackles of tradition. Thank you very much. I was injured on September 28th, 1982. We'd had a small room and contents fire earlier in the evening. When we got back, the women from the town of Chevrolet, where I worked, were waiting to do aerobics class, which they used the firehouse for. So we moved half of the apparatus out onto the apron, and the other half we moved to the front of the Bay Area so they could have the back part of the Bay Area to dance in. After the class was over, the women used to go into the kitchen to get something to drink, and I used to talk to them. And it was while I was in there talking to them that the call came in for the Emerson House. And the Emerson House was a building that we got a lot of calls for. It was an old people's home. And usually they were not necessary calls. So I turned to the woman I was talking to and I said, this is going to be nothing. I'll be right back. As I ran to the truck, I had enough time before my captain reached the truck to put on my coat, my Nomex hood, and my helmet before he climbed into the front seat. As he climbed into the front seat, I threw my boots up into the bucket and climbed in after them. As we pulled out onto the ramp, I reached down with my hand to take off my shoe to put my boots on. The driver wasn't sure 
that he could make the turn without hitting the squad that we had parked out earlier on the, onto the apron. And so he braked slightly, and he never even really stopped, but bent over as I was, I fell out of the bucket onto the ramp. When I hit the ground, I was laughing. I was thinking, I'm never going to live this down. And then as I spun, I saw the wheels coming at me, and they were only about 15 feet away, and I thought, I knew I didn't have enough time to get out of the way. And in the split second before they hit me, I did a lot of thinking. And I decided that if I let the truck go over me, I was going to be flat, that I would be killed. So just before the wheels hit me, I rolled up on my side, and I, so the wheels would push me in front of, in front of them as the truck uh, continued. And I grabbed the undercarriage of the truck to keep me ahead of the wheels. And then the truck was on me. And the first thing it hit was my calf. And then I felt it on my hips, and I felt my pelvis crumbling until I could feel my hip, feel my hip bones meeting together in the middle. And the pain was so great that not only did I feel it, but I heard it, and I saw it. That's all there was. Someone asked me about four months later at Shock Trauma, Sandy, how far do you think the truck pushed you that night? And I said, about 30 feet. It was measured by the Prince George's County Police, and I was pushed 28 feet, 6 inches. I was that aware of what was going on. I was conscious the entire time. The last seven feet before the truck stopped, I felt my abdomen rip open, and I reached down with my hand to cradle my intestines to keep them off the pavement. And now I only had one hand to hold on to the undercarriage, and I thought, I'm losing this. And then the truck stopped. They had reached the road. And I was able to scream. And I screamed, stop, will you please stop? And my captain looked back at me and I yelled at him, will you get this truck off of me? And I heard him tell the driver to back up. And when they backed the truck off of me, the relief and the pain was so great that for a minute I thought things were going to be all right. And then I remembered, no, I just held my intestine in my arms and things were not all right. My captain came back to me, and when he looked down at me and I looked in his face, I knew things were not all right. And I thought, you know, I've got to let him know that I'm still here, that I'm still conscious. And so I looked at him and I laughed, and I said, I'm such a klutz. And he didn't say anything. He reached down, and he felt for my carotid pulse. And then he turned and he started to walk towards the front of the truck. And I felt myself go into shock. And I thought, you know, you can die from this, and no one is ever going to know what happened. And so I yelled, Tex. And he turned back to me and I said, Tex, tell Charlie it wasn't his fault. It was nobody's fault, Tex. He told me later that he walked to the front of the truck and he sat there for a minute with the mic in his hand and thought about what he was going to say because he could only say it one time. And while he was gone, I sat up and I looked at myself. And what I saw was absolutely incredible. My pelvis was crushed. I had degloved all the soft tissue from from my buttocks to my thighs, it was estimated at a loss of approximately 20 pounds. Dislocated both knees, and I had eviscerated my entire stomach contents. My intestines were literally on the pavement beside me. At that point, my shift partner was with me. And I turned to him, and I was real scared, and I said, Bobby, you've got to help me. Don't you let me die. And Bobby didn't know what to do because there was just so much wrong. And he told me, and I remember him kissing me on the forehead, and then he went to the ambulance, but he realized that I had the ambulance keys in my pocket, which were now over somewhere over 30 feet of the ramp. So he went to get a halogen bar to bust in the front windshield of the, of the ambulance when all of a sudden the rescue unit pulled in. The medic unit came in right after that, and I was taken to the hospital, which was only two minutes away. Upon my admission to the hospital, I recognized a good many of the people there. I had gone there many times. And I recognized a girl I knew, and I said, Joe, you've got to help me. Don't you let me die. And she said, get her into the code room. So they brought me into the code room, and a doctor came in, and he said, I'm Dr. So-and-so, and I didn't get his name because I wasn't really interested in that right then. I was just interested in the word doctor. And I looked at him, and I said, am I going to be all right? And he said, we're going to do everything we can for you. And I thought, I know what that means. They took me into the operating room, and I remember as they were putting me to sleep, I turned to the nurse and I said, now you've got to promise me that I'm going to wake up from this. And she, she never answered. I woke up some time later, I don't know how long, and my parents were in the room, and they were holding my hand. And 
I was feeling real weak at that point, and I knew of my two parents. My father was the one that most needed to know that I was there, and I only had, I felt one squeeze in me, so I was laying there. I couldn't even get my eyes open trying to figure out which one was the bigger hand so I would know which one to squeeze. After 17 hours, I was transported to shock trauma to a trauma center in Baltimore. They decided I was stable enough to make the trip by helicopter. It's a 15-minute trip. I was just stable enough. Upon my admissions, I suffered four cardiac arrests. They decided I was not stable enough to take into the operating room, that I was not a savable patient. And at that point, their game plan was simply to keep me stable enough for my parents to make the trip to Baltimore to see me before I died. When my parents came into the critical care unit, they were told that I was massively swollen and massively bleeding. But when they came in, my sister said, they brought, they brought them over to my bed. My sister said, no, we're here to see Sandy Lee. And they said, yes, this is her. And she ran out of the room. And my parents, what they found is they had taken four suction catheters and laid them in the bed so that as the blood came out of me, they could suck it up. And they had channeled the, the sheet so that the bl excess blood that they couldn't get with the suction catheters would run off the end of the bed into a bucket. And my parents sat by my side, and they held my hand, and they watched me bleed. The thing that you have to understand about when you're injured like that is that more people than just you get hurt. I hurt everyone that was with me that night. The four guys that were, the three guys that were with me on the truck and the two medics, all were given counseling and for that I'm intensely grateful because I never meant to hurt my friends like that. One of them threatened to resign that night. I'm glad to say he later changed his mind. Months later when we were talking about it, one of the guys turned to me and he said, Sandy, Sometimes my face hurt from trying not to cry. I was in the hospital, in the critical care unit, for five and a half months. During that time, I went in excess of 130 operational procedures, and I received over 800 units of blood. I stayed in the hospital for a total of 21 months, undergoing additional surgery and rehabilitation. And I've returned to work as of January 1st, 1985, of this year, full time. It's unfortunate that it takes a tragedy like mine to make people realize that a problem exists. But an accident like mine is just simply too great a price to pay for each and every fire department to, to realize that this problem exists. And that's why I talk about the accident to people and try to get them to listen. To date, my accident has cost slightly less than $900,000. To put that into perspective, that's about four heart transplants. And my doctors assure me that as badly as I was injured, it hasn't altered my lifespan, but I'm going to require special care and special equipment for the rest of my life. So there's a financial loss as well as an emotional loss. About nine months after the accident, and I was still being transported by stretcher, but they would allow me to go home on the weekends. They felt that was necessary for me. But I was still in a lot of pain, and I was on morphine. So the fire department had two medics and two EMTs that would travel with me, and I would ride in the back of a station wagon because that kept me most comfortable, and they would follow in an ambulance in case I got in trouble to transport me back and forth. And I made the decision that I was ready to go back to the fire station to clean up my locker. And when we got to the station, and I was doing real well, and I cleaned out my locker, and I was talking to the guys, a call came in for the station. And... I sat on the I laid on the stretcher, and I watched the guys run to the truck, and I watched them go. On the way to Baltimore, after that, we had an accident happen right in front of us. A lady was very critically injured, and she was eventually helicoptered out to the trauma unit. And because we had two EMTs and two medics, everybody bailed out and started to help. And I'd done this for many years, and I couldn't even get out of the back of the station wagon. And I got so frustrated, I started screaming and beating on the roof of the station wagon. And if I ever needed it shown to me that things were not going to be the way they were and I was not going to be able to do what I'd always done, it was shown to me that night. The night of my accident, I did not do my job. My job as a Prince George's County firefighter was to protect the lives and property of the citizens of Prince George's County. 
And if there really had been an emergency at the Emerson house that night, and there wasn't, I would have been no good to anyone because I never got there. Because of me, the entire crew never got there. I find that falling off a fire truck is really nothing to be proud of. It's definitely not the stuff of which heroes are made.